everybody and welcome back to my youtube channel i am dr brianna whiteside and i create faith fashion lifestyle and finance content and so if you're here that must mean that you're interested in one or more of these topics before i get started i want to encourage you to subscribe to my youtube channel and thumbs up this video as soon as you see this because it helps me in the algorithm and it also helps get this message out to like-minded people like you and i who are looking to live our best lives essentially in today's video i want to talk to you about hold on let me pull up my notes because i forgot what the is that In today's video, I wanna to talk to you about participating in the wealth transfer. I know there's a lot of buzz about it. I know a lot of people are approaching this topic from different angles and I too am as well. And so I wanna be as rounded as possible, right? I want to prepare my viewers and my listeners to be well-rounded individuals, not just go with the hype, not just shuck and jive because the Lord said he's gonna do something, but also understand our um, position as kingdom citizens but also understand our responsibility in participating in what he is bringing into our lives and so i want to give you this message about participating in the wealth transfer you all god has really been speaking a lot to me lately and not that he hasn't ever spoken to me before but in the in the vein of the prophetic or in the vein of you know teaching people like you watching he's been speaking to me a lot more right uh, a little bit about my background i grew up in a prophetic house um from the south side of chicago so i grew up around the gifts of the spirit right and so i am an apostolic teacher and i don't say that because i want to get into you know the church war because i really don't um, i'm saying that because of the way that i function and i operate right i am a builder i operate on systems and structures i also am a teacher that is my profession i am a born teacher in a lot of ways and so i also just happen to be an educator college professor um, you can call me dr brie anyway um so the way that god has been telling me that or alerting me that it's time for me to take or move from the front to the back is through these youtube videos he's been confirming and downloading to me and this message in particular started to drop in my spirit yesterday and it was at an inconvenient time because i've been feeling a little sick or a little sickness trying to come up on me so i've been attacking it with i got my um got my orange juice in my favorite mug here and some vitamin c i've been amping up my um amping up my vitamins because i felt a little sickness trying to come on but it was an inopportune time because i wasn't feeling particularly well yesterday when he started to download this message to me in fact the way that he started to download it i heard a scripture didn't know where it was in the bible knew it was in a in the bible i'm notorious for not knowing book chapter and verse but i knew it was in the bible and what i heard was an isaac sold in the land the educator and me went ahead and went on to my blue letter bible app uh, typed in that phrase and landed on genesis 26 right and so that is where i am going to be coming from in this teaching i'm also going to give you some strategies on how to participate i can't just i don't want to just tell you what the lord is going to do i want to prepare you to participate because this is going to need our active participation okay so i'm coming from genesis 26 verse 12 through 14 but i'm going to give you a little bit of background because i don't want to assume that you know what i'm talking about okay so this is the chapter of isaac and if you look in the amplified version of it it says isaac uh, goes to gerard so isaac is the promised son of abraham and sarah this is the son that they waited years for okay and his name as a matter of fact his name means laughter right and so the reason why um <laughs> scholars say that his name uh his parents named him isaac is because when the angel of the lord came to sarah and told her she was going to have a son a child she laughed i abraham's body wasn't working her body wasn't working right so they had already been waiting for the lord for years and now you have this angel saying oh you're gonna have a son or whatever and um 
she started laughing. He said, why did you laugh? She's like, I didn't laugh. And she's like, no, you did laugh, right? So anyway, they end up naming the, the baby Isaac. Um, so in Genesis 26, fast forward a little bit. Um, in Genesis 26, there's a famine in Canaan. And if you listen to my previous videos, I've spoken about famine right i've told you about the significance of famine i've told you that i want you to study famines right because in genesis 26 where we're coming from there is another famine this is not the famine that abraham experienced but this is isaac's famine right not isaac's famine like you know he calls the famine but this is the famine that he has to endure so there's a famine in canaan and the bible says that isaac went to gerar gerar now the land of Gerar means a lodging place in the Hebrew. Um, it means, and I looked up lodging because I don't want to, you know, assume that I know everything. And the word lodging, the definition means a temporary living place or sleeping place. So ultimately it's a transitional land. Gerar is a transitional land for Isaac. Verse three says, that um, God specifically tells Isaac not to go to Egypt, but to go to, but to remain temporarily in Gerar and promises that he will be with him, bless him and his descendants, and he will perform the oath that he swore to Abraham. So this is before we get to, you know, the verses that I'm really going to be talking about, verse 12 through 14. I'm giving you a little background here in verse, um, Trying to see what's going on with my eyelash. Sorry. Okay. Um, in verse 3, God tells Isaac, don't go to Egypt. The reason why God tells Isaac not, not to go to Egypt is because I think that would have been the logical thing to do. Abraham went down to Egypt during the famine, right? And so if Abraham went down to Egypt, I'm pretty sure you know how families talk and pass down stories. He could have told his son, we went down to Egypt when there was a famine in the land and god specifically says hey no i'm not gonna take you that way that's not where your increase is gonna come from i know what history i did in the, in the past right i know what history tells you to do but i have something that i want to do in your life now and it's not gonna be in egypt it's gonna be in gerar so he tells him to temporarily remain in gerar and promise that he will be with him bless him and his descendants and that he would perform the oath that he swore to abraham this message, as I said, builds on a previous message, the have and the have nots that I did released a few days ago. So I want to encourage you to go listen to the have and the have nots after this message. OK, so you'll be prepared. So I looked up what it meant when the Lord says, and I will be right, because he tells them that I will be with you and I will be means to come to pass. So the Lord is telling Isaac, right? The revelation of verse three is that God is telling Isaac to live in a temporary place. And while he is there, he will bless Isaac and his seed by giving him countries. And he will bring to pass the oath that he swore to Abraham. At this point, Abraham is, Abraham is dead. And God is promising Isaac um, that he will still keep his promises to a dead man. We could go ahead and insert a praise break right there because so many times we struggle to obey God because we think he's a liar. We think because, you know, his time has been delayed that he's not going to fulfill his promises. And I really know what it's like. And this is no shade to anybody. I know what it's like to wait on the promise of God and time starts to decay. And I'm like, did I miss you? Did you lie to me? You know, something's not right here. So I really do understand. I'm really sympathetic to people who, who have been waiting for the promises of God to happen in their lives for such a long time, because I too am still waiting on promises. But I want to encourage you that God, if God is concerned with the promise and the oath that he promised Abraham, and he's telling Isaac, Hey, I'm going to do this thing because I promised your dad. That, that should bolster your, your faith and your trust in him a little bit more, okay? God is not lying to you. He's not breaking his promise to you. You know, he's not breaking his promise to your parents if they were believers. He's not. He's not. But his times are not our times. I would love God to operate on my timetable. But I'm not God, right? If he operated on my timetable, that would mean that 
I'm God and I'm not and I'm not even built for it but I have to ultimately remind myself that if God God is thinking generationally when he promises you something right we see here in verse 3 that he says that I will bless you and your descendants he told Abraham that I will bless you and your descendants right and so he's thinking generationally he's the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob right generationally so the promises that god has for you and have promised you are not just for you so just practice a little bit of patience okay posture yourself because if you don't practice patience god will allow something to throw you into a deeper patience process and no one no one likes that trust me you don't want to be there okay all right, let's move forward. So the promise continues in verse four. He will multiply Isaac's descendants and give them the lands through and give it the, through them the lands. Why? Why is God blessing Isaac? He's blessing Isaac because his father obeyed. Look at verse five because abraham listened to and obeyed my voice and consistently kept my charge my commandments my statutes and my laws so god is blessing isaac because his father obeyed him so your obedience too is generational right your decisions right now don't just impact you they impact so many generations after you, right? And we, I know sometimes we like to sing that God is a covenant keeping God and he is, but he also keeps those negative covenants too, right? The Bible is a book of laws, a book of rules. We are, as kingdom citizens, we are in a monarch. We are in a monarchy, right? God is the monarch. This is not a democracy. So when he says that something is allowed or disallowed, and then we try to um, go ahead and, you know what we do put our two cent on it or put our spin on it i don't believe i don't believe god here i don't believe god there he didn't ask for our agreement or what you believe he said this is how it stands right this is what this is what it is these are the rules and the laws of the land and so this is what you know you need to follow and if you follow my charges my commandments my statute my laws you will eat the good of the land right you will be prepared for everything that I, that is coming your way and so we see God promises Abraham something if he obeys, which he does, and then the blessing reaches his son. So Isaac's about to walk into, is walking into the blessing of his father. So again, I just want to remind you that how you live matters. When you make ill-informed decisions, they're going to show up in your lineage, right? I can't tell you how many, how much I am having to pay for because someone in my lineage decided that they weren't going to obey God. Right. Um, but we just have to keep moving forward and obey God the best as we can. Right. It, it can stop with us. So the story continues. Isaac and his wife stayed in Gerar. Um, he lies about his wife being his sister, like his father. And I don't want to park there. Um, because a lot of people already parked there. Right. But Abimelech, the king of the Philistines calls him out on his lie and Isaac confesses. So now we're all caught up. Now we're all caught up. Let me drink some of my orange juice. Okay. So let's go. Let's recap. Let's look at um, verse 12 through 14. Okay. It says, then Isaac sold in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. All right, let's break that down. Let's break down verse 12. Then Isaac sold into the land and he received in the same year a hundredfold. Friends, I need you to understand that the land is an economic system, which means that Isaac participated in an economic system while there was a famine. Don't forget that the context matters. He sold to sow in Hebrew means to scatter seed. So Isaac sold, he scattered seed or he invested 
into an economic system and he received a hundredfold on his investment. The Cambridge Dictionary defines hundredfold as a sudden hundredfold of increase, right? And so you know that word suddenly means surprisingly. So Isaac had to participate within a world system while there was economic hardship in order to suddenly reap a return on his investment a hundredfold. How does this relate to you? Because we are there right now. We are in the middle of economic systems collapsing. We are in the middle of what some may call a soft recession. We're there. There is no, there is no, you know, denying it. But what can we do about it? Nothing. How can we make it work for us? I'm about to tell you how as soon as I get through this message. I mean, get through the rest of this message. All right, so um, then there is this wonderful punctuation mark called a colon, right? Sometimes people read over colons. They don't pay attention to the punctuation in the text, but punctuation matters. I'm an English professor, so I know. So there is a colon uh, in this verse indicating that what follows is an explanation or an elaboration of what precedes it. So the scripture reads, then Isaac sold into the land and received in that same year a hundredfold colon, right? And then what comes after the colon is, and the Lord blessed him. So if we look at the sentence, then we can see that it was God nudging Isaac to one, um, endure the tensions of this temporary place, right? Gerar, this temporary lodging. But while you're in this limbo, in this in-between place, I want you to invest or scatter seed in the economic system of Gerar in order to yield a sudden return on your investment remember in the biblical days they wasn't trading during isaac's time they wasn't trading with money currency in the way that we do but land um animals all of these things those were part of their economic currency right and so while isaac may not have sold dollars and cents he did participate in that economic system while everything was on sale while people were um hoarding their seeds while other people were afraid to sow into this place because there was a drought isaac said okay i am going to not let uh, this crisis go to waste i in fact i am going to um i am going to see a return on my investment because i'm going to invest what other people are withholding all right so then verse 13 says and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So let's break down these words. Wax great in the Hebrew means to grow, to become great or important, promote, make powerful, magnify, or do great things. Forward, because he said, and he went forward, means to proceed, to live a manner of life. And I looked up the definition of manner of life, and it means how you think and act at all times, right? A, your state of being and so the the scripture continues and he grew until he became very great grew means to become great very means exceedingly or abundantly and become became great means powerful or to do great things so the verse summary here is and isaac became great and proceeded to live in in a manner or a state of being of greatness and grew until he became abundantly powerful to do great things. Then there's another colon, right? And again, as I told you, that the colon in the verse indicates that what follows is an explanation or an elaboration of what proceeds it, right? And so how did Isaac become so powerful and great? Because he had wealth because he reaped a hundredfold on his initial investment, because he participated in the economic system when other people were running away, right? Other people were running away from the burning house. Isaac said, this is an opportunity. Everything's on sale. Let me sow into this land because it will turn around and I will reap a hundredfold on my investment. 
And the Bible says that verse 14 says, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants and the Philistines envied him. Possession means a state of having, right? Owning or controlling something. Flocks mean small cattle or sheep or goats. Flocks refer to something in small number like three to 15. Um, and then we have herds. Herd is a large group of animals. Um, and then they are kept together as livestock. And so your herds are kind of like 30 to 70 in number. A great store breaks down means to, to have many. So a great store, that phrase, because it says that he had a great store of servants. A great store is many. And servants and servants is either service or household of servants. So Isaac ran a business as a, as a result of this. As a result of reaping 100 fold, he was able to provide a service in the time of famine. And then there is this colon again right there's another colon there and it says that um what is the verse for he had possessions of flocks comma and possession of herds comma and great and a great store of servants semicolon and the philistines envied him so ultimately uh, the philistines envied isaac because he was producing at a much greater rate than they were Right, they were jealous of them. Why were they jealous of them? Because they too were participating in the economic system, but they were they were not favored by God. God favored Isaac. Friends, I'm trying to get you to understand that in order for you to be positioned for God to bring wealth and riches into your house to get a hundredfold of an, an, a return on, of your investment, you have to invest something in some type of system. I'm not just saying, you know, stock market. I'm saying, what about the housing market? What about buying land? You know, I, I know that in Christian circles, we talk heavily about spiritual gifts and that is true. But in this scripture, God is talking about physical and tangible things, blessings, right? And while I appreciate all the spiritual gifts, I want the tangible gifts as well. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I'm just going to leave that there for you. Okay. I want you to, to, uh, understand that God was encouraging Isaac to invest in the economic systems. And so I want to kind of talk to you about some ways to invest in the economic systems. I want to give you some insight because I want you to pre be prepared. Um, in this season, this is the season where God will allow you to prosper in a famine, right? But you must move outside of fear and obey his strategy. What if Isaac did not obey God to, to go to Gerar and instead went to Egypt, right? Do you think he would have reaped a hundred fold on his investment? No, because that's not God, where God tell, told him where the provision is, right? He had to be where God told him to be. He had to move in a way when God told him to move. But you can't allow fear, fear of the unknown, fear of, you know, I've never done this before, fear of I don't know what to do. No, if you if God is nudging you to, um, sorry, y'all. If God is nudging you to do something, it's okay if you don't understand how to do all of it start preparing start walking that way and the revelation will come to you when i first started investing it's like 2020 and you know it's when a lot of millennials got into the stock market because we was at home and you know we because of the one nine and we started putting our money in the stock market and i was like this stuff is weird i'm probably never gonna learn how to do this but i did i learned how to do it and it's been really good to me the stock market and the crypto world has been really good to me. It's been very kind to me. And so um, I also want you to understand that we're, a lot of people are talking about wealth transfer because it's here. But I want you to also understand that God wasn't just interested in blessing Isaac. He was interested in blessing his descendants. And why was he interested in, in, um, in advancing his descendants because it's about generational wealth if these are the descendants of isaac then these are kingdom people and they're going to expand the kingdom god is invested in kingdom expansion 
more than you are. He wants a return on that investment. But so many times we are not obedient to what he's telling us to do. And we think we can do whatever we want to do. And he's just still going to pour out these blessings. And I, I, I just, ha I want us to stop because I think that more times than not, we tie God's hands, right? There are things that God would do because he is God right? Because he wants to bless his children. But then there are other things that are conditional. Majority of his words are conditional to us. If you do this, I will do this. If you obey me and obey my laws and keep my commands, I will do this. What we think is that we can, um, we can not obey his laws, but sow seeds and, you know, somehow manipulate God because we put, put money in the ground over here when he told us to obey. You can't sow your way out of disobedience. You have to obey. And I, that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes, but I want you to understand that you're, you cannot run around a church and just say, oh, I ran around church and now I'm free. There is obedience attached to some of them. Now, some things do break off you instantly, but some things break off of your life as you obey and you go from glory to glory and from faith to faith, okay? So God is not a genie. Okay. You can't just rub him and just think he going to do whatever you want to do. No. Have you been obedient? Are you doing what he's telling you to do right now? Right now. M me showing up on YouTube is an act of obedience. Y'all I've been up since 5 AM. It took me two hours to study this stuff out that I'm sharing with you. Then I had to get ready set up the camera, do all this other stuff. And I, I still haven't even started my work day. Okay. I still haven't started prepping for class tomorrow, but because I'm obedient and I feel that there is a demand on my life to do this, I have to prioritize the kingdom. When we're thinking about wealth transfers, we're thinking about transfer that, that equals responsibility. What, when God transfers something to you, that means that his priority has to go to the top of your priority list, right? It's not easy. It's not beautiful. It's not glamorous. It's responsibility. And I want to sober you up because I see a lot of videos about people talking about wealth transfers and it's true and it's here and it's coming, but also there is responsibility attached to it. You need to be responsible now. You can't just be living random. You can't just be out here just, you know, throwing caution to the wind. Time is out for that, right? And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to prepare you. I'm trying to sober you up because you, you can miss it. You can miss it if you're not prepared. You can miss it if you haven't proven yourself to be trustworthy, right? Let's just be honest here, okay? So, it's not for you. The wealth transfer, some of it's going to be money. Some of it's going to be possession. Some of it's going to be resources. Some of it's going to be relationships. All the things. It's not for you to be stunning and trying to be flashy. It's for you to expand the kingdom through influence. And how do I know that influence matters? Because the scripture records that the Philistines were envious of Isaac, right? The Philistines were envious of Isaac because when you have money, you have influence. When you have money, you have power. You have mobility, right? You can change systems and laws in your direction. And for a long time, a lot of Christians haven't had that. But time is up for that because God is raising up people and putting money into the hands of people who can affect change like you and I. But you must be prepared for the transfer of responsibility is not just transfer of wealth. It's a transfer of responsibility. Okay. And I hope you've been doing your due diligence in, in the dark before we got to this moment to prepare yourself for what is coming next. Let me get some orange juice. All right, so let's get into the practical side of transfer. Okay, so according to Forbes, fortunes are often forged or fumbled away in the fire of economic downturns. Y'all, this is really good news. I know it sounds pretty bad, 
but it's, it's really good news. Let me read it again. Fortunes are often forced or fumbled away in the fire of economic downturns. Why is this? Because of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. During economic during economic hardship, people spend less, store up, hunker down, which are all good, right? Which are all responsible things to do. I'm preaching about responsibility here. But what happens when that hardship is over? Have you let the crisis go to waste? I always say this, don't let the crisis go to waste. So yeah, you know, you closed your hand during the famine, right? Yeah, you hunkered down, you stored up, you saved your money. But then when you come out of the famine, you have the same thing or potentially less than what you had when you went in there. What am I telling you? I'm saying that if you close your hand during economic hardship, you're going to kill your seed. What if Isaac didn't sow in Gerard? Would he have reaped a hundredfold on his investment? No, because he didn't plant it in a ground. And I'm not, this ain't a message about you sowing into me because I'm not even going to ask you a fight for no money. I'm saying that are you sowing into the economic uh, systems while they're down that you want to see a return on investment in? Are you? Think about this in God, in, 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 in a, uh, an idea of God. All right, this is just coming to me as I'm speaking. God invested so many seeds of greatness within everybody, right? And he knew we was going to be raggedy, live our raggedy lives. And some of us were going to choose him and choose to obey. And some of us weren't. He knew this. But he still gave us, though, planted those seeds of greatness, even when we were in our raggedy phase, which is down, right? When we're down. Because he knew one day he's going to get a return on investment. So what if God said, no, I know you're going to live raggedy for 10 years and I ain't invested nothing in you. He can't expect a return on investment from you. What you're seeing me do right now is God reaping a return on investment of the gifts that he had plant, implanted in me and cultivated over the years. This is his harvest, right? What harvest is he getting out of your life? What, what, what is the ROI? Because it would be foolish of you not to think that God doesn't want an ROI. I mean, you and I want an ROI all the time, right? Reciprocity. So what ROI is God getting from your life? It's food for thought. Okay, so let's quickly talk about um, the stock market. Really quick, brief overview. Um, formed in the late 1700s, um, a small group of mer merchants made the Buttonwood Tree Agreement. The men met daily to buy and sell stocks and bonds, a practice that eventually became the New York Stock Exchange, right? That was the late 1700s. 1790, and I got this information from um, the source is SoFi. Um, and so in 1790, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange is formed, helping spur the development of the US's financial sector and the country's expansion in the West. 1896, and this is just like some pivotal, you know, moments 1896 the dow jones industrial average which we just call the dow jones is created it initially has 12 components that were mainly industrial com um, companies 1923 the early version of the s p 500 is created by henry barnum poor's company poor's publishing it begins by tracking 90 stocks 90 stocks in 20, 20 1926 sorry about that in 1929, um, the stock market crashes after a, the decade-long roaring 20s, and we're kind of familiar with that, which spurred into the Great Depression, um, when speculators made leverage bets on the stock market inflating prices. We got a lot of inflation going on. I think right now we're in the process of deflation. Um, during the decade of the roaring 20s, speculators made leverage bets on the stock market inflating prices. The rise in the share prices was followed by the stock market crash of 1929, and a share took years to recover the key uh, bit of information that I want you to hold on to is that they did recover okay then we have the crash of 1987 when corporate buyouts on portfolio insurance helped prices in the stock market run up until October 19 which becomes known as Black Monday 
Um, in the United States, the Dow Jones dropped 22.6% in a single trading session, a loss that remains the largest one day stock market decline in history, but it did return, right? 2008, the stock market crashes after the boom and bust of the housing market, along with the proliferation of mortgage backed securities in the financial sector. On September 29th, 2008, the stock market fell 770, 777 points in a trading day. It was at the time the biggest drop in history. The immediate cause of the market crash was Congress's initial refusal to pass the bank bailout bill that would stabilize the American financial system after a series of historic stocks, but it did recover. 2020, which is the one we're more familiar with, right? In 2008, I was in high school, graduating high school. And so I didn't really know much about inflation and all this stuff right now, but 2020, now I'm aware that the stock market is crashing, right? Because we lived through the one nine situation. Um, and so from February 12th to March 23rd, the Dow Jones lost 37% of its value and the New York Stock Exchange trading was suspended several times. I was a part of that. Um, the stock market rebounded on August 18th, the S&P 500 was hitting record highs. On November 25th, the Dow Jones crossed 30,000 for the first time in history. I was a part of that and I got them gains. Trust and believe me. So historically, I just want you to understand that um, September has historically been the worst month in the stock market. We just left that month and it went back to visit June lows, okay? Um, and it may or may not recover in Q4. Historically, it has recovered in Q4. We I, Sometimes God defies you know, history and does what he wants to do. And so, or it may stay low. Either way, it doesn't matter, right? Because it will recover. I'm trying to get you to understand that this is a buying opportunity. And I understand that we have people who don't have high risk tolerances and that's totally fine, right? Totally fine. Um, but your risk tolerance is higher than you think. If you get on a plane, if you drive your car, if you uh, go to a football game, especially in times like these, if you send your kids to school, if you just wake up and breathe, your, your risk tolerance is higher than you think, okay? So what it really is, is it comes to this fear of this unknown. And I want you to get out of that because you have to sow into a system to reap of that system a hundredfold. Okay. So I know a lot of people don't really know how to get started. And so this is just a brief overview. I may have to do a, a longer teaching on it, but it may come at a later date. So I want to give you a brief overview about you know, some of the brokerages that you can probably think about using and brokerages. I mean that the institutions that allow you to trade on their platforms, right? So the brokerages, um, are that have apps that are kind of user face friendly for me, the easiest one is Robin hood. I, I have Robin hood, but I also have Webull and I also have fidelity. You can use E-Trade as well. So Robin hood would be the most easiest use user interface, but they are problematic. They've stopped a lot of trades in the past and, um, you know, they come along under a lot of fire, but I think for a beginner, for someone who is just looking to start parking their money somewhere, I think Robinhood is excellent. I also use Webull. Webull, the interface, and I mean like what you see on the screen is not as intuitive, um, but I really do like Webull because they allow you to, to make trades pre and post market, right? four hours before the market opens and four hours after it closes. Fidelity, I have Fidelity. It is one of the more um, traditional brokerages. I have my Roth IRA there and I was actually making some trades in there this morning. Um, and so Fidelity, you can also use and then E-Trade. My, one of my parents has E-Trade. So that's for stocks, for crypto, because I do invest in crypto. I learned about crypto. Uh, back in 2019 when I was trying to learn about Forex, I didn't succeed at Forex, but I did succeed in learning the strategies. Excuse me. So Coinbase is the most intuitive. Coinbase is the brokerage that the, the, the interface is incredibly easy to read, right? Of course, you have Weeble. As I said, the interface is not as easy. You can do Robinhood as well. I live in Vegas and we can't trade Robinhood, do crypto on Robinhood. I'm not sure why. Maybe it has to do with the casinos, but 
we can't do it and so i have those other platforms um I'm also looking for a third platform because both of these exchanges, the Weeble and the Coinbase, don't have some of the coins that I'm looking to invest in. So I'm going to continue to um, look for other brokerages to diversify my money because I believe that your money should be diversified. So I want to encourage you to dollar cost average into stocks. Dollar cost average or DCA means put something on it, right? If a stock costs $100 and you don't have $100 to spare, do you have $10? The cool thing about stocks is that the majority of them allow you to buy fractional shares. And by fractional shares, I mean buy a piece of the pie. So if you can't afford to buy the whole $100 share, you can buy $10 worth of it. You have started to get your feet wet and $10 does make money, right? And so every chance you get, I want you to start buying what you can of stocks right now because they are down, okay? They down. My, a lot of my portfolios are red right now. They down. So what the cool thing, if you haven't started investing though, is it's your first go round. You're going to make your gains faster than the rest of us. Cause the rest of us who've been in for a while, we're going to be trying to recover our money. You're going to start making money faster. Cause once it go up, it's going to hit your level first, right? And so that's a beautiful thing. One thing I want you to consider is buying solid stocks. You want to buy solid companies okay i know there's a lot of hype out here about meme stocks or or about like speculative things and if that is okay if, if you got the money to go in there and you know invest on the speculation totally fine this is no shade right i have some money on the speculation right now but what i'm saying to you for building long-term wealth and longevity you need to have your money in high growth stocks or long-term stocks that have proven to be around. Like your, and this is not financial advice, I gotta say that. Like your Apple, right? You got an iPhone? Do you have a MacBook? Do you have AirPods? Apple or Amazon. I order from Amazon often, so of course I'm gonna have Amazon. Google, right? Microsoft, electric vehicles and charging stations. This, I'm saying electric vehicles and charging stations right now because this is where we're going. They may not take off this year, but by 2025, they, we're going to be a dominant, uh, we're going to be dominantly electric because of climate, right? And so those electric charging stations and those vehicles that you invest in now will give you a lot of money and a lot of them are under $10, okay? Um, and then tech companies, there is a new mountain of influence rising and it is the mountain of tech. Okay. And so if I'm a tech girl, right, I love technology. I study it. I use it often in my classrooms. And so you want to get in these tech companies, y'all early, you know, early investor. Um, but not only did Isaac, you know, have the herds, right. And that's what I think the stock market would be the herds. He also had the flock, right? He had the flock. So small returns, right. And I think a flock, and if we're going to equated to today and a money system i think of flock as a savings account i'm not talking about your traditional savings account with your bank your bank is not going to give you the apy return that you are looking for as a matter of fact i looked at my um my savings account at my bank and i think i only made like 10 cent for the month on um on the money that's sitting there and while, and then in my other high yield savings accounts, I made 10, $13 in those accounts, right? On similar amounts of money. What am I saying? I'm saying that if we're, we're trying to get our flocks together, right? We need to diversify our money. And so your traditional bank is not gonna get you there in a savings account, but your high yield savings accounts will give you more bang for your buck. So I have three, I have one with a credit union who is offering 2% APY um on the money that i just have sitting there so they give me two percent earn i mean increase the growth on the money that's in there uh, i have american express who gives me two percent on the money i have in there then i have capital one who gives me 2.15 percent hands down capital one gives the most money um 2.15 percent on the money i have there what am i saying i'm telling you that there's always more than one way to skin a cat Okay. There's always more than one way to skin a cat. If you don't have the tolerance of a stock market, okay, how can we get you to, 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 to secure your flock? Let's go high yield savings account, right? But if you do have $20, like 
or even ten dollars y'all a cup of starbucks coffee costs almost seven dollars so sacrifice your starbucks coffee and invest that seven dollars you you threw it away anyway when you drink that coffee and you pass it through your body it's gone right it's gone it's gone okay um one thing, one fascinating thing that God has been talking to me about lately is about buying land. I didn't know the first thing about buying land, so I kind of put it off a little bit because I'm like, I don't even know how to buy land. Like, I don't, I don't even know where to start, where to look, where even to think about it, right? Um, so I, but I did, ha I have started the process of researching it, right? Going on Land Watch, seeing what's available in different cities or the cities that he tells me to, to think about, to look at. And I've started that process. And so while I'm not versed in buying land or real estate, I'm going to start versing myself in it because if God is nudging me there, that means that there will be an ROI coming, right? And so these are just a few ways that you can participate in the wealth transfer. You have to sow into a system. Okay, whether it be real estate, stock market, high yield savings accounts, whatever else, crypto, whatever it be, you have to invest. Something is required of you in order to get that return. So I hope this video really encouraged you. If it did, can you please, please, please thumbs up the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, share it with a friend, and also consider um, subscribing to my mailing list at BriannaWhiteside.com because a lot of stuff is going to start rolling out there really soon. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.